Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Bismillahi rahman rahim wa sallallahu ala sayyid al-mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam ajma'een Greetings of peace, my brethren, my sistren This is Baraka Blue and you're tuned into Path and Present Podcast This episode of the podcast is with my brother Farooq Messiadeen Farooq is a uh, really special, uh, beautiful-hearted human being from Edmonton, Canada. He has an organization that he heads up and directs called Tarjuma, and it is really a a great organization which, you know, uh, serves community and really makes the deen relevant in our time and and speaks to the people. Um, I had the opportunity to go up to Edmonton, I think, three times now. The first couple of times were with... uh, Usama Cannon, and I know that Frug has worked closely with Usama and closely with Ted Leaf. Uh, Tajima, I think, as he says in the podcast, as he calls it, is a Ted Leaf inspired organization. Um, and uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Ted Leaf, you can uh, you can check their website out. It's a wonderful organization that I had the opportunity to to work with in the past, and uh, you know. Our brother Osama Cannon has done amazing work, and we pray for him uh, because he's someone who has been afflicted with a, a difficult uh, disease at the moment. And so we we pray for his health. And uh, at the end of the podcast, we do we do a proper prayer for him as well. So anyway, I just wanted to to welcome everybody to the podcast and thank you all for listening. Uh, Farouk, and uh, you know he's someone who has done a master's degree, really thinking about community, community building. He studied a lot into uh, church organizations in America, so much so that we would kind of give him a hard time because he knows about, he knows way too much about church, man. We're like, well, <laughs> you know, but he, he really did research into religious communities and what it means to be a, a religious community, and what it means to be a religious organization and the difference between organizations and communities. And he's uh, someone who uh, has this kind of academic training, but he's also someone who's implemented that. And he's been working in communities and in education for, for many years. So I always uh, value his, his insights. He's really well read on, on these topics and um, but he he wears his scholarship very humbly as well. But he's someone that I always love to talk to and always love to present new ideas when I'm thinking about community and thinking about, you know, uh, Islam in the West and, and these type of things. He, he has a lot of insights that I've benefited from. And I hope you'll benefit as well mm-hmm. from these. Um, if you want to support the podcast, the best thing you can do is share it, uh, word of mouth. Let your people know, anybody who you think might be interested in it, uh, pass it along to them. Uh, also, you can like and comment on iTunes. This helps it uh, move up on the iTunes charts. Um, and also subscribe, uh, so then you'll get the podcast directly to your uh, phone or other devices. Um, and... Uh, you can also support financially, which allows us to just put more time into this. This is kind of a labor of love at this point. So we kind of uh, get around to it when we can. But but uh, those of you that are supporting financially help us to, to really devote more time to it, which we would like to do because the medium of podcasting is really uh, profound. And you're watching how it's changing the discourse and it's it's providing the space for real, long, meaningful uh, long form conversations that aren't just sound bites where people can actually formulate I- ideas and debate topics and think about things and think through things um, in a meaningful way. And it's interesting that that this medium has, has taken off where people think, oh, they used to think on TV, right? You need to have a segment that's, you know, just a few minutes long and everyone gets 10 seconds to talk but you know now there's podcasts some of the most popular podcasts are two and three hour long conversations you know unedited and that proves that the the we are yearning for deeper meanings and deeper connections and deeper conversations uh about real topics so if you find value in this uh please do support we have a patreon 
patreon.com slash path and present, uh, or you can find the link on our SoundCloud or our iTunes as well. Yeah. And in addition to that, keep us in your prayers. All right, y'all. One love. Peace. It's a trip. Like whenever I think of Edmonton, I think of the cold. But I know now <laughs> it's warm. Like you and, and you, you guys have like super long days in the in the, in the yeah. summer. Yeah, yeah, so it was I, super long. How come you always invite me up in the winter, man? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we just invite you in the winter so that you really appreciate it when you eventually come in the summer. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, we we have super long days. We start out we st- when we were fasting. We would start it up at. Uh, 245 ish and then we ended our fasting well past 10 um, so so my first meetings with you were within the tet leaf community and also coming to edmonton and visiting your community there mm-hmm. and we always used to give you a hard time because you were always going on and on about evangelical communities and church planning and you knew so much that we were like why does this they seek <laughs> <laughs> from Edmonton knows so much about evangelical Christianity and its communities. So I'd just like to know uh, for our listeners, how did you get into that and how did that relate to your path and your interest in just religious and spiritual communities more generally? I kind of, you know, that's funny. I, I really just stumbled into it uh, because my exposure growing up to Christianity in general, evangelicals in particular, was skewed through the prism of polemics. Um, so it was listening to like Ahmed Didat debate Jimmy Swaggart and just enjoying that spectacle, watching Muslims debate Christians. Often it was evangelicals who were on the stage up against these like Muslim uh, debating powerhouses. And I never really thought m- much about uh, Christianity or evangelicalism or evangelicals. I, I thought Christianity was really a pretty homogenous. Frankly, I didn't have a nuanced understanding of what was happening within that larger faith tradition. And I think in 2000, I want to say 2012 or 2013, I stumbled into this alternate um, uh, article about this church in Seattle called Mars Hill that you, 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 you've visited, I think uh, around that same time. And it was a fast, yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> right through this article, I think, and the article was pretty was a very critical article uh, of the institution of its leadership, um, and it was the article was trying to uh, grapple with this up and coming church uh, amongst millennials in particular in what is considered to be like one of the more kind of uh, unreligious. Uh, parts of the U.S., in Seattle in particular, in the Northwest. And um, specifically with this church, you know, it had this very charismatic leader by the name of Mark Driscoll, and he um, he offered this very almost conservative perspective on um, the ro- gender roles and um, perspectives on family life and things like that. But he was hip, or at least that's how they how they described him in the article. He was he he wore the right clothes. The music at the church was right, and it pulled in thousands of worshipers. They had, they had membership across the state that was in the thousands. They were expanding across the U.S. Uh, I think when they did a, they held an Easter service in 2014 or something like that. They did it at a stadium. They couldn't host it at their church, so it was it was a big deal. So I went on their website, and I was just fascinated by the. By, by stuff that I, you know, people of our generation are interested in, like how they were doing their videos and their website was really, was really slick. Uh, the branding was on point. And I was like, yeah, I can see myself if I happen to be a, like a white millennial living in the Northwest, I might actually dig this too. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of became infatuated with them. Like I, I was, I tracked along with their material. I, I, I was like following them on social media. And then all of a sudden um, they dropped off I think in 2015 or or maybe around 2014 as well, um, and the the church folded. Uh, but prior to that, I realized that what I was seeing in that church, like or what I found fascinating or interesting about it, about that church and its appeal to large segments of you know otherwise you know unreligious demographics, was actually happening across the U.S. and across the world, and even in Canada as well. That there was a segment of evangelical Christianity that was reaching 
uh, parts of um, uh, of the public that weren't being reached by other uh, religious institutions. And so that's, that's, that's kind of where it began. And I realized that there was something there that was, there was a trend there that um, uh, I thought was really fascinating for me as somebody who's grown up in Muslim communities and religious communities. Yeah, and when has I went seen, there, just for reference for people that aren't up on Mars Hill, right? You know, it's really, you walk in, it's in an old warehouse. It was like, exposed rafters and piping that's all painted black the whole thing was painted black inside and kind of dimly lit like a almost like mm-hmm. a concert like you're going to a concert or a club and you know it was pretty packed it was a sunday service and mm-hmm. uh, you know basically what tripped me out first off is that the like you said mark driscoll he wasn't physically present it was just a big right. screen of him talking and apparently this was broadcast to all the churches. So, you know what I mean? He could only be in one place, but, and he, you know, gave a, a sermon speaking on a specific Bible verse. I can't even remember the, the topic exactly. Mm-hmm. But then the live portion was a, was a band and it was very like right. alternative rock kind of like, you know, jamming out. And they, <laughs> they projected the lyrics on the screen, big screen. And, you know, it really had this kind of like hip, seattle grungy flannel shirt you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. rock out album Mm -hmm. like we were at a concert and uh you know it really tripped me out in that sense and i did get the feeling of what you said like you know dark denim jeans work wear you know hip (laughs) haircuts and the whole like it definitely had the vibe um and that article you sent me the critique of it really was that uh, you know, you, you mentioned Seattle. It's actually the least church going region of the Northwest, you know, where I grew right. up. So, right. and, you know, it's very, people, it's, people are outdoorsy. There's a big influx of kind of Eastern spirituality. So people are much more likely to go on a hike to connect with something mm-hmm. greater or go to, you know, mindfulness meditation or yoga than church. But here in the center of all that is this like really, huge evangelical movement that kind of took on this real hip and kind of edgy vibe but the critique in the article of course i think it was in the stranger or something like that which is kind mm-hmm. of you know, a very liberal left-leaning local newspaper is that they're repackaging the old traditional you know uh conservative values in a hip angle and so that right. was what they were critiquing so but yeah. Yeah, so it's really interesting but but I'm interested also in like your research and maybe you could share, you know, what you did with your, with your master's thesis and your research and how that also relates, you know, with the Muslim community and the, the Christian evangelical community. Yeah. My, my research um, trajectory went all over the place. I began uh, my, 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 my graduate work looking at, Muslim education and thinking about how, um, you know, classical Muslim education can intersect with alternative forms of, of, of learning, mm-hmm. thinking about like radical pedagogues and how some of those ideas uh, might intersect with the ideas of, you know, a medieval Muslim pedagogue. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where it started. And um, what I, what I quickly, not quickly, actually it took me a couple of years to figure out was before I could talk about, you know, education, and the Muslim community, community, I needed to think about the Muslim community itself because I was <clears throat> trying to uh, locate some, some, some common narrative around education within the Muslim community. And it was, it was really, it was confusing and I couldn't, I couldn't put my finger on it. And I realized eventually that, there, you know, I had to unpack, you know, what the, what the, what the boundaries of the Muslim community were, what those dynamics were like, what the tensions were, and having grown up in the Muslim community, born born Muslim, um, that was a naturally compelling compelling topic. So, I'm I'm looking at Muslim education and Muslim community through my graduate work and then in my community work. Um, uh, as you said, like we, we were we're talking about community in the context of these up and coming Muslim institutions like Tetleaf Collective. Um, and then at the same time, I encounter this uh, this really fascinating evangelical movement, which is in plain sight, like it's all around me. But you know, I, I had never really uh, looked into it. Um, 
So it's my, my research is a convergence of all those three things uh, coming together and trying to unpack what are, first of all, what is the Muslim community? How do we define that, that really vague uh, collective? And then secondly, what, you know, why has there been such a, such a big um, uh, pushback on the community itself or what seemed to be even like an exodus of people leaving the community? Um, there's been these res interesting responses like Tetleaf being one of them. Um, other responses that I looked at as well in my research, like um, these, these considerably alternative spaces like the El Toki Juma Circle in, uh, founded in Toronto and with chapters around, um, around the U.S. and actually in, in the U.K. as well, I believe. And then in South Africa, other places in the Western world, in the English-speaking world. And uh, 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 films like on Moss, like there seemed to be something, there seemed to be a moment in like the 2010, 11, 12, 13, 14 period where there was a real focus on the exodus of Muslims or Muslims pushing, pushing against like the normative, um, like, like these normative modalities of community life and the research began that's kind of where the research began yeah so like if we think about um you know the previous generation of muslims whether it's you know there's a few trajectories whether it's you know, kind of uh african-american muslims um whether it's you know nation of islam uh imam wd muhammad's community etc setting up communities and then you have various immigrant communities coming to north america and setting up mm -hmm. mosques. I mean, the center of communal life in across the board is the mosque. Um, so whether it's a you know Arab, often it's quite ethnocentric mosque, right? So it's like maybe right. some Yemenis come or some Lebanese come or some Pakistanis come, and they create a space that reflects their kind of back home feel and vibe, and where they can worship and and connect with people of a similar, not only religion but cultural background. Um, right. But then you have you know, the children of those immigrants or the children of, you know, black Muslims or then converts of various stripes and backgrounds um, coming up, like you said, you know, millennial generation or, uh, you know, just before that and really not finding their communal spaces in those same spaces. And so searching elsewhere for, for what it means to be part of a community or for their religious identity and practice. So maybe you could, you could just talk about what you think that phenomenon was or is, or is it still ongoing or how that manifests? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's important to start where you started, which was, you know, uh, decades ago uh, and, and how, you know, post 65 um, uh, Muslim community in North America transforms things because prior to that you have uh i wouldn't say uh homogenous uh muslim communities but you have you don't have the type of diversity that you obviously will have post 65 and there's there's like this there's really a market shift after the borders open so to speak um in the ways that muslims organize themselves and in the ways that like institutions pop up and you have the emergence in the 60s of what uh zurina grewa calls the the Uma institution, like right. the institution so that for people is that don't know, for people that don't know, 65, right. right. Is when the, the immigration laws changed and, and largely right. come of, you know, the, on the heels of the civil rights before that, you know, it was very hard for non-Europeans to, to come to America. But after that, the borders opened to, to other nations, which meet, which meant a kind of influx of Muslim immigration to the country, uh, to North America in general. So that's what you're referring to. That's right. Yeah, exactly. And that, that, that forever changes the Muslim landscape, uh, in North America. And you have, like I said, the emergence of these, like these large Ummah institutions, like the MSA, for example, on college campuses, which isn't about, it's not about being, you know, um, uh, black American and Muslim or white American and Muslim or uh, Indian or Pakistani American and Muslim, but it's about being, first and foremost, Muslim in these lands. And somehow the, like the circle of concern for an Ummah institution like the MSA is Muslims everywhere. Like it's, it's not just locally, but the sort of like uh, the concern is well beyond its borders and that changes things pretty dramatically. So you stop thinking about just your locale 
uh, and you begin to think about the Ummah at large, and you think about Muslims, you know, uh, across the world as part of, yeah, your circle of concern. And so, post '65, you have these 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 institutions emerge, and that type of Ummah institution perspective translates as well into mosques, and mosques throughout the United States become. You know, they, they ideally, in their best form, people would argue, are these multi-ethnic, uh, very diverse uh, houses of worship that attempt to do everything that uh, a relig- a rel- people would expect of a religious community. So, um, obviously, be a house of worship, but also be like a social center, be like a place where you get married, be a place where you get therapy, be a place where, uh, you know, your kids go out and play, and also where your kids will go to learn and adults will learn. Like, they become these... Um, in the in the minds of people, these um, these super centers for religious life, and that happens that that that's still happening. In fact, that's kind of like the expectation of mosques for mosques across North America, which is which is very different from their historical their historical function. Um, in my research, I found that there was like these two competing narratives about what mosques uh, should be. On the one hand, you'd find people say that mosques should be exactly what, as I described them just now, like, you know, these uh, uh, multiplexes where you can get whatever you need uh, uh, as, a, as a believer. And they'll cite usually the historical example of the Prophet's mosque and say, well, the Prophet's mosque was so much more than just a, just a place where you prayed. It was, it was like a community center. It was like an embassy. It was like, a, you know, there was a lot of things happening within the Prophet's mosque. And then you'll, I found people say, well, a mosque should actually be primarily, first and foremost, a house of worship, a sanctuary, uh, a sanctified space. And though often people who took that position often cited classical Islamic law and will point to the fact that, you know, this is not just any other space. This is a sanctified space. There are certain times that certain people can enter, certain people can't enter. It was, it was, a, it's a holy place. It's a sanctuary. It's almost like a temple, uh, if you will. And so um, that tension, um, um, has been playing out, I think. And you see that happening. Uh, you see that tension playing out with people's responses like the Moss, uh, like the film on Moss, uh, like some of these organizations that I mentioned, these institutions that I mentioned. And I'm um, just like the discourse that, Muslim, that Muslims have on social media and stuff that you just hear from your friends. Yeah, so what do you think it is really that caused so many people kind of of our generation to check out, or at least the perception that people checked out of these these catch-all spaces that were created by the previous generation and kind of sought community and spirituality and identity, et cetera, et cetera, elsewhere. Um, yeah, that's part, of, that's part of what I've been trying to, what, what I tried to uh, track in, in the thesis. I think, I think the first thing is that um, these institutions, when they were first established, were were augmenting um, uh, pre-existing communities. So you had um, someone from Lebanon, for example, who moved often uh, having like connections already within the village, uh, from the village, um, moving to Canada or somewhere in the States and finding other people from their village or from neighboring villages with whom they do community with. And the mosque then augmented that experience like that's where you prayed and maybe got married etc but there was there was that already happening on the back end outside of the mosque space and along with that connection with people from your village you had extended families and you had uh, traditions and you had um, um, routines and you had things that you just you know communal life was not something that you learned uh, by reading a book but just something that you inherited by being born into these pre-existing um, communities, uh, and often these immigrant communities. Uh, and then what's, what, what I think has happened is that that infrastructure um, has begun to, begun to you know, piece by piece be dismantled, or at least be weakened. And you no longer have that extended family. You can't take the extended family for granted anymore. You can't take the fact that you'll have these communities of uh, uh, ethnic affiliation or whatnot for granted. People no longer associate in, the, in those same ways. And what's happened is that the expectations that you would normally have on, say, your extended family have transitioned to 
the mosque, like, or the people who frequent the mosque, or the people who associate with a particular Islamic institution, like, like an Islamic center, for example. And we're, we just have been, we've been simply unequipped to, to deal with that expectation. And as a result, um, you know, you see two things happen. One is people, people demand for that to be filled by that, that void to be filled by an institution like the mosque. And then two, you see people saying, okay, well, it's not going to be fill, fulfilled through the mosque. So I'm going to go do my own thing. And then in response, people say things like, oh, you're abandoning the mosque. You know, the mosque is a sanctified space. You know, it's the, the mosque is um, um, held in, you know, high regard in scripture, um, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that tension has, you know, that's the tension that you see, you see played out. So, yeah, exactly. So you mentioned kind of like, especially around 2010, perhaps, uh, and then this whole idea of the, the phenomenon of the unmasked phenomenon, which is, was a big conversation in Muslim spaces and, and online. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. then you've had this conversation around third spaces. Yeah. Uh, but then it seems to kind of have fizzled out. I mean, you don't hear those conversations in, in you know, less than 10 years later. Right. Uh, and you know, what do you make of that? Yeah, the, those conversations for me were really fascinating because they were borrowing, like the unmasked uh, uh, term itself was borrowing something from, from the church world, which was um, that term unchurched. And I thought that, was, uh, that for me was always a fascinating misnomer because uh, for people within the church world, somebody who's unchurched is someone who's never been to church, who's never been part of the church and has never had a quote unquote church family. And they use a different term for people who were once part of a church and are no longer part of church. They'll say that person's de-churched. And so I found it really funny that I found it interesting that, you know, right at the, right at the offset, right at the beginning, uh, we were, there was this misnomer that we were wrestling with uh, the translation from, the uh the you know a term to describe the tensions from one community was being mistranslated into another community and that's for me that's not maybe that maybe the implications aren't as big as i'm making it out to be but for, uh, it was interesting it was an interesting point of departure um but when that when 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 i saw that emerge and i was actually going to use on as one of my case studies but it didn't quite fit in um in the range of stuff i was doing for the thesis um what what i found really interesting about the mosque, the unmosque conversation was that the um, there there was there was a disparity between what people said that they wanted from the mosque mm. and what people who were doing like who were organizing mosque uh, mosque activities or building mosques said that they were going to offer in the first place. Because you found that I found that when when people would when I would go around and ask people what a mosque is first and foremost, like what is a mosque? there was there was like a range of a range of responses people would say like i said a community center it should be this it should be that but people expect that a mosque will be a physical space like that's that's an obvious definition for a masjid it's it's a physical space and all of the and people who were building mosques were uh, buying land and building buildings etc and people who um who had critiques of these mosques uh would say things like it's not friendly um, it's not welcoming to certain parts of our community. Um, access to power is limited. All with the exception, all these things being with the exception of like what is usually um, uh, like the women's space. What does women's space look like? Mm-hmm. With the exception of that particular issue, they were all non-space questions. Like they were, they were basically like, you know, this is not a welcoming community uh, and uh, it's not a space for youth or we're not like the content that's coming out isn't relevant to, to young people or millennials, et cetera. And I found that really fascinating. Um, and um, I think that because of that, because of that dissonance between really critiquing the physical space and the programs that come out of it, I think, I think that's in part led to, to the fizzling out of that conversation. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting, right? Because, there's always this interesting tension for me. Um, and I had, um, you know, you studied kind of evangelical Christianity and you looked at those communities really in depth. And I actually benefited a lot from hearing you speak about that because I know next to nothing about that. My interest as kind of like a comparison to the Muslim community was always other quote unquote Eastern religions that came West, particularly, you know, uh, uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. 
Right. And those are really interesting case studies, obviously, because, you know, they're minority groups from the East, but also because there's large groups of Western converts who are also creating communities. And one of the things that, uh, that I've discussed before, and I had uh, Philip Goldberg on before, uh, who wrote the book American Veda, which is one of the books that I recommend to everybody who's interested in, in just religion in America, and, and particularly Muslims that are interested in this whole project of Islam in North America or the West. Mm-hmm because there's so many interesting parallels. And one kind of like useful uh, thing that he uses that I've discussed before is he talks about that a religion fulfills five functions. So, uh, and he gives them the prefix trans. So translation, transmission, uh, transaction are the kind of outward Mm -hmm. aspects. And then there's uh, transformation and transcendence. Mm -hmm. So, you know, without going, too deep into that people can listen to that podcast I did with him uh, for that more in depth but you know transaction uh, transmission all these aspects translation they're kind of the outward esoteric aspects of religion how do we you know what are the rules regulations how do we pray how do we fast Um, you know in the study of these things which are very important but then he Mm -hmm. says that there's a kind of inward more contemplative Uh, esoteric aspect of each tradition, which is focused on uh, internal personal transformation of the soul, and then eventually transcendence, which, you know, he defines as kind of expanding or dissolving the boundaries of the ego or the self and, you know, uh, etc. But what's interesting Mm -hmm. about that, that he he mentions is that a lot of uh, immigrants coming from the East they're trying to create communities and spaces which preserve transmission, transaction, translation, which preserve what it was like back home, which have burned the same incense or which, uh, you know, have the same rights of, of, of when a baby's born or when someone gets married, which reflect that and which feel, you know, the feel like back home, mm-hmm. which is understandable. But he said, but the thing is with converts to Buddhism or Hinduism, which he points out, you know, people that took a guru or who started taking on aspects of Hinduism, they very rarely actually became fully Hindu. It was more taking aspects of that tradition, whether it's philosophically studying Vedanta or whether it's, you know, Hatha yoga, et cetera, et cetera. But these communities were predominantly uh, convert communities even when they're led by a, by a teacher or a master from the East. And they almost had, they had almost zero interaction with the, the communities of immigrants who came from the East. So right. you could say there's a meditation center or a yoga center as opposed to a kind of Hindu temple or a Buddhist temple, which is predominantly um, you know, immigrant. And I found that very interesting. And also because you know, for, you know, for, I think a lot of the, the converse, not all the conversation around on mosque, but a lot of the stuff with third space and Tetleaf particularly, and others of these alternative spaces, a lot of it is, is, is converts. At least there's a, there's a high proportion of converts involved who are mm-hmm. saying these spaces, which are predominantly um, preserving a specific immigrant cultural uh, ethos, they don't necessarily fulfill the 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 desire that we have for actually embracing this religious tradition and practicing it and then again you find the children of these immigrants also being culturally american or canadian and so finding more connection and and relevance to to their path in those quote unquote alternative spaces and so on some level it is a it is a it is a generational divide but it's also almost kind of like a you know, relating to those levels of of trend, you know, like what, what do we really need as a community? You know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I I think the, I think what's really, I love the, I love that, uh, um, that uh, typology, by the way. And I think that it, that it speaks to a lot of uh, what we see happening in the Muslim, the broader Muslim community. And I always like, whenever I say Muslim community, you know, it's in, it's in quotations because I think that's, I mean, it's an it's a useful term because I, I think we all know what, what I mean when I say that. Um, 
but then I think it's also a problematic term because it loops a bunch of people with very different positions and different ideas about what it means to be Muslim all in the same pot. But yeah, I think those, I think that, that, um, that rubric is helpful. And I also wonder whether or not, so with, with these Eastern traditions, I think one of the big ideas is that, you know, these Eastern traditions provide some clarity around transformation and transcendence. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, trans transmission, translation, and transaction, that's kind of like the space of the church, for example. The church provides uh, the community, the church provides some idea of how to do ritual worship and, um, you know, conveys a sense of meaning and purpose um, around around community. But I, I, I wonder whether or not Muslims are are kind of falling on uh, on those three as well. Like we talk about relevance, for example, and I think that would probably be connected to translation. Um, people not having a sense of belonging when they come into communal spaces, not feeling like they can connect. You know, the standard convert story about being embraced when they convert, but then having no one around during Eid, uh, celebrating Eid on their own, having iftar on their own during Ramadan. Uh, not having, not really having a community show up after the first week of of their Islam. So, are we even meeting like the whole transaction piece? And I think that was also part of the, the 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 pain that was being unearthed when we saw the conversation emerging a few years ago. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and I wonder to what extent, if you could talk about, because you you mentioned you highlighted that there's a difference between a physical space and a community or a mosque yeah. and a community. Um, are those one and the same? Are they not? Um, I'd love to hear about that. And then that kind of leads me to a broader question of what is community in the modern world where we're not all living in the same village or walkable distance to it, to our house of worship, which you find in all traditional societies, whether it's mm-hmm. Florence, Italy, or Fez, Morocco, or, you know, Indonesia or wherever. Um, mm. and, 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 you know, to not to pack too many questions into one, but, you know, the whole the internet and, and how we're all interacting like that. I mean, conversations we're having, I mean, this podcast is a perfect example, like, you know, right. people from all over the world are listening to this conversation about community online that's recorded. You and I are in two different continents recording this, you know? Um, right. Right. So yeah, I'd love to just hear you kind of reflect on that. Yeah, they used to. They say that in the church world, they say that um, the challenge for the, today's pastor is that back in the day, he was the only show in town. Like he was, you know, you you came on Sunday because I mean, when when else would you hear somebody give a even mildly entertaining address or monologue? And you know, today, I don't need to do that. I can turn on YouTube and watch Stephen Colbert give me something far more interesting than probably most preachers could give me. And then also, when it comes to religious content. Um, uh, I don't need to go to a religious center to hear anything. I can get everything right at the t- you know, tip of my fingers. And I could probably get a preacher or somebody speaking about something that I want to hear about who's far more articulate, far more well, you know, well-versed well in that thing than I can get locally. Mm-hmm. So the, the question that, that, arises, that arises as a result is, you know, what's the function of these religious spaces? If the content that we... Um, that we used to depend on them for is no longer being provided from them. What are they supposed to like? What what are we supposed to get from them? That's a, like that's a, one of the big questions that that churches in you know in my research have been grappling with. And their response is is, is to say, uh, you know, the church isn't a building. The church is a community. In fact, like the the word church, there's the word church itself doesn't appear. They would say in the Bible, um, the church, the word in Greek that would appear is ecclesia which is basically a Greek word for gathering. Um, it's not a, not a church building. Um, uh, that, that word is now, like in, you can see that in English translations, but the, the argument is that that's not, the, that's not in the original Greek. And so they, they would say that, you know, the church isn't the, the building, it's the people to, you know, the, it's the community, it's the people, um, it's your brothers and sisters, if you will. Um, and I think that, Muslims have a harder time making that that same argument. You know, you would have just just linguistically making the argument that you and I are the mosque. Like that, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, 
because when we say that we mean like a physical uh, an actual physical space um uh so yeah like the 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 internet has disrupted the way that we think about how these institutions are supposed to serve us and the needs that they're supposed to serve us. The response that I found really interesting from churches was that, you know, they, they'll say like, you know, we cannot, we can't ensure that your local pastor or preacher will have a better sermon than what you could find online. Yeah. But there's something that you can't get online that you can only get uh, in the flesh, in person, when you see a person face to face, and when you hold space with that other person and when you meet in community, like physically meet in community, um, you can get some of that online for sure. Like you can get a, you can get a, an exchange, you can be in contact, but there's something unique about being, uh, being in the same space, being in the flesh. And they have a bunch of theological stuff that, that, that wraps it up neatly for them. Um, and I think it's true also for like, for Muslims. Like I remember back when, uh, <laughs> back when, uh, uh, they first started broadcasting prayers from Mecca and Medina on the internet. It was on this website, I think, called Islamic City. I think Islamic City is still around. But they had to have like in big, bold letters when you when they would stream it back in the late 90s that, you know, you can't pray congregational prayer with the imam from Mecca or Medina. Like, go to your, go to your local mosque. And um, you're watching on TV and you stand up and pray and follow them on TV. That's right. That's right. It was like this warning, like this won't, this isn't legit. Go, go, go to the mosque. Um, yeah. So we, we, there's, there's already kind of built in into our religious discourse that something, something just can't be virtual. Like we know that some things just can't, cannot be virtual, but if you rely on content, if, if, if what we expect these institutions to provide and these communities to provide to be kind of exclusively, exclusively, or, um, mostly content, then yeah, they'll, they'll be, they've been disrupted and they've been kind of upended. And, you know, people are more likely to listen to a YouTube talk than uh, what's coming out of the, uh, what's coming from the member uh, during a Friday khutbah, if, they, if they're in fact going at all. Um, so that's one thing I think about when I think about how the, how like internet, the internet and technology continues to disrupt these institutions. And then, and then also, um, I'm also interested in how, um, they just bring people closer together. So now you can, now you can, uh, in the church world, for example, you can check out a church, for example, without even stepping foot in it. Like you can check out what's happening online. You can check out their Instagram page. You can check out to see what their community looks like, at least from, from arm's length uh, on a screen before you step foot in it. Whereas before the thing that you would, you know, would pull you in would be maybe like the church sign on the street uh, that, you know, hopefully was clever enough to make you think about, think about stepping in um and that's no longer that's no longer the case i think some of the best communicators probably today come from you know people would say come from the church world like a lot of the leadership stuff the business leadership stuff comes out of the church world so the you know evangelicals have really found an inroad into um into these spaces that they wouldn't have otherwise access to you know like they the, one of the biggest leadership uh, conferences in the world is a global leadership summit that happens in Illinois, and that's um, under the auspices of of a like the original uh, mega church, Willow Creek Community Church, uh, in, uh, in outside of in the suburbs of Chicago. And in that, at the global leadership summit at this church that's broadcast around the world, that's where you'll have like world class leaders show up and. Um, give these talks on leadership because in their, in their minds, you know, the church needs to have a voice with leadership on leadership because they need to influence, you know, businesses and nonprofit organizations in ways that uh, are beneficial to them and um, are beneficial to them and, you know, are service to them. So, and then that's broadcast, like I said, it's broadcast broadcast around the world. So the church has found some interesting ways to kind of, to kind of use it. They'll also have these things called online services. Like you can actually attend church, online and the way that the way that looks is you know you you have like a screen where the worship plays um i'm not sure if you actually participate from your computer screen or from your computer desk um uh but the band is playing or whatnot and then the guy comes up and gives a sermon and then there's like a chat room where people are having conversations and uh are like you know shouting back to the preacher if you will on the on these chat rooms they're fascinating to me. I mean, I, I think again, like a lot of this stuff wouldn't translate uh, for for Muslim communities in the ways that we do our ritual worship and the way we convene as a community. 
but they're interesting they're interesting movements away and the reason why for me that's really fascinating is in the whole unmosque conversation what i found people doing a lot was comparing themselves to evangelical churches like when uh, an imam would leave uh, uh, a mosque for example that he would write a blog post and i have a couple of examples in my thesis of you know imams leaving certain spaces then saying well you know the evangelicals do this that the other thing um you know people in the in the whole unmosque conversation will say you know why can't our mosque be you know the least most the least bit welcoming when like the church down the street is out uh in the parking lot serving orange juice to 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 newcomers and visitors and stuff like that like it seems like just by virtue of us being in this part of the world we're always uh in juxtaposition to like the christian uh to the post-christian world or the christian world um to our evangelical neighbors to our christian neighbors um and that's just that's just a natural conversation that we feel very comfortable having because it's just around us so i think yeah the east the eastern example is really fascinating uh because it dislodges us from that binary like muslim christian in the west and it asks some other questions as well but i think also in that binary in the muslim christian binary there has been a bunch of stuff that hasn't been um uncovered and um you know, they would argue that the, with all the technical technological advancements, you will still need somebody to lean on, and you'll still need, like, literally lean on, like somebody to, like, you'll need someone's shoulder, and you'll need to see someone face to face, and you'll need to cry with someone at times, and you need to celebrate with someone sometimes, and those things can happen online. Like, you can you can you can post a, a, a status on Facebook and say, you know, I just graduated from medical school and you know and um, you know you'll get a 500 people who will put hearts on that and you'll you'll get like a rush of dopamine or whatever and be like yeah that felt good but they they'd argue that that's not adequate like you actually still need people who you can touch who you can hug and who you can sit beside and so increasingly what you're seeing is churches saying that's what we do like that's if if we're in the business of anything we're in the business of actual face-to-face relationships and so in that that rubric, what they're really kind of drilling down on is, is the transaction piece is to say that we, we, we do the, we do community well. And unlike any other place in the modern world, you will find community here because it's rooted in, in faith and rooted in the belief of the afterlife and rooted in, you know, this idea that my connection to you is not just transactional. Um, it's, it's something that extends into the, to the hereafter. And then they use that context. They'll say that that's the, that is the, that is the best context for transformation to happen because transformation doesn't happen in, in, in isolation. Like you, you transform in community, they would argue. And uh, you know, the way you do that is you have circles of accountability. You have uh, people who are in roles of mentorship. You have people who are comfortable enough to call you out when you need to be called out. Um, And again, for me, seeing parallels um, in, in, in like the Muslim, the Muslim experience, um, you kind of have to go back a, a little bit further back before the quote unquote Umma institution or the mosque um, as we see it today in North America and go back to the other primary um, institution of kind of Muslim religious life, which would be Sufi brotherhoods um, and then the, their associate institutions like the, the Zawiyas and the Khanqas or the uh, Dargas and, su- and such, and how like Suhba. And like your connection with your sheikh and your mentor um, and the people who are also on that same path was considered to be the context in which transformation would emerge. It didn't happen. There were moments for sure where you were like isolated and moments where you would have to be alone and by yourself. But um, community life was a large part of your spiritual journey. So like this, 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 what you see happening in the, uh, in the church world is to say like, that's what you can't, you can't, Technology can help, but technology can't, can't at least not yet, replace that. Yeah. Yeah, that really brings up two kind of, I hear you hitting on two um, areas which are really interesting to me. Um, mm-hmm. And one is how, you know, it's related to how inter- the internet um, and social media are changing not only communities, but particularly the question of authority within religious communities. Mm-hmm. And um, at this point, you know, like you say, in, 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 you know, before the internet, um, it really is about charismatic speecher, uh, speakers, learned teachers, et cetera, et cetera, are gonna draw followings, um, mm-hmm. you know, and, and maybe 
uh, learned teachers that are respected by their peers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for their, their learning, et cetera. Whereas mm -hmm. now, so much of someone's reach and, and authority comes from their ability to be kind of viral, to go viral. Yeah. Um, yep. And so you see particularly a lot of people that are uh, really becoming leaders and authorities in our community are people that are really engaged and, and touching on you know, social activism and, and especially issues that are going viral and are able to kind of like insert themselves into those conversations um, and, mm -hmm. and reflect and, and be, you know, internet savvy and things of that nature. Um, so, you know, for instance, um, Omar Suleiman, who I know he's, he's a, he, I think he actually has a physical space and community. I don't know that much about him, but, he, but how mm -hmm. I know him is as this really uh, dominant internet personality who's really, he's at the rallies, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's, you know, things for anti-war, whether it's other things like that. And he's doing a lot of work across communities with other faith leaders, et cetera. And I know that for young people, people in their teens and 20s in the Muslim community, he's like a, a kind of rock star imam. And I, I, I don't know how much of that has anything to do with his actual in the mosque teaching. And then you have other people like Linda Sarsour, who, you know, she, as far as I know, um, doesn't have like a physical space. She's with Empower Chains and she's really, you know, leading women's marches and she's really active on social media. And so she becomes this really powerful kind of authority within the community. Um, mm -hmm. So those are just two examples that come to mind. And then there's the other thing where the social media going viral, the kind of infamous, the negative things where, um, you know, uh, what's his name? The, the, uh, the one who had Bayana, it was a Bayana. No, 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 no. Yeah, no, 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 no. Who, you know, people within the Muslim community will know that reference because, you know, there's a really a kind of scandal recently with him. And then also there was the interesting kind of case study with uh, Imam Suhaib Webb kind of calling out Sheikh Hamza Yusuf for his statements at RAS, which was at a physical <clears throat> event, but he posted it online and it became this huge communal uh, discussion. So I, I wonder mm -hmm. if you could speak to those, those issues. Yeah. So for me, when I think about authority and how people, how, how, these, how religious figures pull followings and, you know, have uh, these platforms for, for me, well, for me, when, when I, when I first was doing my research, I found it really difficult to find the vocabulary to help me navigate through some of these questions and to understand the dynamics happening in this space because you know the, the the most common nomenclature to help navigate you know dynamics in muslim communities even to this very day is like things like to call certain people reformists or reformers and to call certain people traditionalists um to call some people modernists like that's usually those are the big camps that are usually drawn uh to 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 help us shape the um sort of the landscape, the, like the Muslim landscape. And for me, like that, it just didn't, it wasn't very helpful. Like I couldn't really um, sink my teeth into that and it wasn't analytically very useful. So I went out looking for other frameworks and the one that I came across was um, this theory called the theory of religious economies, which is, which is a theory in um, the sociology of religion about how religion functions in society. And, I mean, right at right off the bat, I have to say that I was pretty resistant to um, to the theory and to the analytical framework initially, and um, that resistance carried on for like several months uh, before I eventually gave in and decided to to use it in my research. And I still use it sometimes because I find it again, I find it analytically useful. So the the theory basically is that, I mean, in short, it's that you know, religion is something that um, um, is is on offer, if you will, in society, and you have um, suppliers and demanders uh, of of religion. And in depending on the different on the marketplace, you might have a, a command economy, a religious economy, where like the government has tight control over what happens um, in the supply 
of religion and you might have more free market economies where like you know you have different suppliers and there's a little bit more competition happening um in that setting and like right off the bat when you hear that for me that just sounded really icky like to use to bring religion into to use religion and then have some sort of like market analogy and commercial analogy just makes me feel like it made me feel it felt wrong mm-hmm. um and i had to spend a lot of time unpacking why that was and um one of the one of the things that finally made me feel like i could use it was when i realized that within sacred texts like the 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 notion of exchange the notion of buying and selling is used within sacred texts to talk about our salvation like in like sort of bakara the 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 words trade and exchange are used to talk about our guidance uh, you know in uh, surah fatir the trade again is used to talk about our salvation um and good deeds and such like trade and exchange uh, are used within our ancient sacred texts not in the same ways that we we think of them but for some reason like when we think of trade and exchange it's always tied to global capitalism and we can't think of it outside of those terms um so in any case like that that i say that all because when people when people hear me use even the term religious economy sounds icky to most to most people and i had to spend a lot of time convincing my supervisor that it was an okay analytical framework for me to use so anyway i when i, I you know i use that i use that framework because i find it helpful and the the reason why it's uh, for me i find it helpful in the, to to go back to your question is there's there's a demand out there like there's a demand if you will in like the religious marketplace for religious leaders who are simultaneously you know grounded by um by their tradition as well as um relevant and speaking to social issues and uh they're there they're present they're speaking to them they're marching they're you know and Omar Suleiman does that very well they would in the theory of religious economies they would call him a religious entrepreneur not to say that he's out there for money but to say that he he offers something that there's a really really big demand for which is somebody who's you know he's young right like he's 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 only in his 30s uh but he has uh, like a classical training but he's very relevant and he speaks um uh from the heart to these pressing social issues um and i think i think you know you find that in in like the muslim kind of the muslim market if you will um muslim religious market you find that what for me the tensions that are emerging is is there's a demand base that that isn't being served you know there's people who are asking for certain things demanding certain things if you will and it's not a command economy like you can it's not like there's one supply um there's you know people can pop up and they can meet those demands um if they have the right the right tools to do so of course technology being one of them um and you know that demand is going to be filled by someone and if it's not people who are you know serving in existing organizations or existing institutions it'll be filled by someone else and in this case for most people Omar Suleiman uh, uh is a as you said like an internet figure even though he has a physical space he has he's he's very active if not in the leadership of a mosque in in Texas um and so that void is going to be filled because there's the demand for it right so i guess in a sense what i'm hearing is you know before the internet Uh, it was a similar thing where you would have had a, a a mosque or a church or some community space and then you know essentially it's no different if you're in a traditional uh city in the, you know say Cairo you know 100 200 300 years ago you know people are going to go to the mosque where they know like there's the the, the preacher that they are into whether it's mm-hmm. their school of thought or just like that person is really engaging or very charismatic or even funny or fiery or whatever they are looking for you know so they're going to mm-hmm. seek out the individual like that and you know you're saying that in in kind it's no different it's just that the internet has made it so that now the people that supply what is demanded right the supply and demand mm-hmm. right uh, you know if they fit into that and they can kind of use the platform of the internet whether it's videos, posts, blogs, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that they're just going to 
be able to utilize that platform as opposed to needing to create a physical space or be in a physical space. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think, um, you know, that that transformation is not unlike a lot of other transformations, like the way news media, print media, and the internet has changed that. Um, so too is that same impact being felt in like religious um, religious communities. Um, but again, I would I would just circle back to say that I think that sometimes people conflate the presence of these large um, internet personalities. And again, I'm not saying that disparagingly. I'm just using it as a descriptor, like these large inter- internet personalities, as replacements for what you would get, uh, what you would get in a, in like a local community. And yeah, your content could be served by that person. Like that that content, some of your content might be the content that you hope to get might be served uh, through listening to a YouTube uh, video. But um, the experience of communal religious life doesn't really happen unless you're, you're there in the flesh, which is like, you know, we'll be able to extrapolate uh, a good talk onto the internet, but will we be able to extrapolate good sohba onto the internet? I think you can get some of that, but I'm not sure it can be done and fully, but you you might you might have a different opinion about that. Can you can you get good sohba? Can you get good community, long term, meaningful community to the extent that it can replace the in person community, like the flesh, the in flesh community? It's a good question, and I I know in your uh, in your thesis, which I looked over, that you mentioned the ilmu fi sudur wa leisa fi sutur that this beautiful Arabic saying that knowledge is in is in hearts, is in breasts, and it's not in lines on paper. Right. And so and, and it's not in, in lectures on YouTube as well. That there's a you know, Islam is really you know, that that goes on to say that if it wasn't for like a chain of transmission that anyone could say anything. But that there's an idea of authority is actually linked back to connection unbroken chain and that it doesn't actually mean someone who read, read a book with someone who read a book who someone who read a book who read a book who read a book with someone who read a book right. while reading this book with you and that gives you a thing. right it's really the emphasis is someone who sat in the company of 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 somebody who sat in the company with the tabi'in who sat in the company with the sahaba who sat in the company of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam uh, who ascended to the, the the highest of heights in the in the company mm. of Al A'la, Subhanahu wa Taala. Mm. So, um, you know, that's really what what is interesting for me because, of course, there is something that happens in transformation and in physical space, and there's so many cues that are, that are received. And my experience is that people that have been exposed to that to the suhba they don't always make the right decisions. They don't always, you know, I don't always connect with them on every level, but there's kind of an edeb, this emphasis on like prophetic character, akhlaq, and a, just a way of etiquette of dealing with human beings that is really like infuses the, the way these people are. Right. And you can't get that from the internet. There's no way. Right. And, you know, we think about the Sahaba, that they are that the companions of the Prophet are the greatest generation unanimously. And it's many of them only you know, knew a few short surahs, right? right? But no one would claim of the later period who memorized, you know, all the Quran, and all the books of Hadith and, you know, books of law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No one would claim to be equal with them. And what is it? And it is that suhba, literally the sahaba. And, you know, mm-hmm. I always reflect on the fact that the, the, the people around the Prophet Muhammad Mm-hmm. They're not called his disciples. They're not called his students. They're not called his, you know, they're called his companions. Right. So that the primary thing that he was giving them was companionship. And and the, from I can speak from my personal life is that my great, my greatest lessons and my greatest uh, insights and hopefully you know the good things about me. Uh, if there are any, they came really from not because I heard a great lecture and not even because I heard a lecture in, in person, but it's mm-hmm. 
because I got to sit with people, you know, these these great teachers after the lecture, see how they interacted with their family, or see how people right. were with with in, in different lived situations, and that's mm-hmm. what I worry about about the internet, and, and particularly this kind of. It's one thing to speak on social issues on the internet, okay, it's fine, but it's another thing. This kind of call out culture, and, and you know, if people, uh, you know taking shots at other scholars or, or, or um, you know, people, the scandals around people's behavior or what people said, what, however true it is or whatever happened is almost besides the point because if there's an issue in community, um, that's the real thing. You know, so if we take that RIS kind of scandal, it's like if we were actually a physical community and there was a, a teacher who had said something that that was hurtful to a, a percentage of the congregation that would be addressed in that community and someone would would, would would address it and then there would be a response and then there would be a either a reconciliation or, or an apology or a debate or a conversation and, and right. the community would come together or they would split ways and say this is irreconcilable but mm-hmm. ultimately the, the internet doesn't allow for any of that Right. And, you know, just to seeing the way that that played out was really uh, disheartening on people speaking on any side of the debate, whether it's defending mm-hmm. so-and-so or attacking so-and-so or, you know what I mean? It just was like, man, it, it really kind of convinced me once and for all that I'm going to remove myself from having, from attempting to even engage in these conversations on social media because they, they don't allow true communal discussion and interaction to take place it's kind of yeah. this anonymous uh thing so yeah yeah totally yeah they they that was the other thing that um I, you know earlier i had said i often will say the word muslim community in air quotes because i think that it's it's um it's too ambiguous and sometimes it, there's a lot of assumption built into the use of that term so like in that in the instances that you just mentioned the, the muslim community Right, took to Twitter, took to Facebook, and we were we were debating it online. The you know people in this you know so-called community, and that's how we term it. Like that's how we talk about literally every single self-identifying Muslim in like a national center, or like a or in a country, or uh, on a on a continent. In the case of North America, between Canada and the U.S. at the very least, like we'll, we'll, every single self-identifying Muslim is part of the same community, which is a of course, that's a really loose use of the use of the term community because it suggests that the it's adequate to just simply identify to the same faith to be part of a community. But I think, and the academics acknowledge that uh, in my in in my research, it was helpful to find terms like uh, uh, counterpublic being used because counterpublics, um, uh, the way that it's employed to talk about Muslim communities is to say that there's a whole bunch of people talking about. And debating about the same ideas and the same terms, and their debate by virtue of them debating and talking about the same terms, they're part of the same counterpublic. Um, that kind of happens outside the purview of like the, the the general public, and that's that was that's helpful because it helps us think about people who are on you know two different you know sometimes even two different parts of the world. How do we think about them in the same? in the same collective well it's by virtue of them being virtue of them talking about this uh about the same idea or debating about the same idea so and so that was that was helpful but then i found that you know when you limit community to the debate about ideas and just conversations um then there's never you never get to think about whether or not it's acrimonious or harmonious you never get to get to the things about community that we expect community to provide us, like a sense of home, like a sense of belonging, like some compassion, etc. Because really, uh, what what is a community of debaters except for people who are um, in it to to maybe win their argument or to get some insight, some intellectual satisfaction? Um, but what we expect from community is something something more, you know, something something far more than what you can just get from um, from this large you know, international collection of, of debaters, which I think is what you see play out on the internet often. Yeah, so I know you're not only, um, you know, 
in the academic sphere, you're not only uh, writing papers in, in the ivory tower, but you're also, you know, a community organizer and you're involved in community on the grassroots level and you, you kind of are very involved in specific organizations at Edmonton and, and to, a, to, a, to an extent also you're engaged in other communities kind of uh, in North America as far as speaking to different organizations, et cetera. So I wonder if you could just offer some reflections on on that and that experience and uh, how each aspect, your, your kind of academic work and your community work have informed each other and where you are on these issues. Yeah, the, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not an academic by any stretch. I'm sort of like a, just like a wannabe junior <laughs> academic, you know, my graduate work was pretty limited in scope, but I've, but just by virtue of being um, in the Muslim community, you know, you end up having to deal with um, academic discourses because it's the, the way that it's presented to us from the very beginning. Um, you know, like we're junior high kids who can barely write essays and we get introduced to terms like supererogatory devotion or like ablution and stuff like that. Like it gets pretty heady right away when you're in, uh, you know, when you, when you introduce to tradition in that way. Um, so I found working in the Academy to be, uh, you know, very brief, you know, just doing some research to be pretty intellectually stimulating and intellectually refreshing. And, um, and sometimes, you know, intellectually, uh, satisfac satisfying to like engage in the realm of ideas but then you know when you take off your 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 academic hat uh, you know you're left with being a son a, f a father a brother a uh, friend and for me like trying to wrestle with the questions of being a good father brother son student teacher etc of the various like roles that I play in my life was maybe like, I wouldn't say more satisfying, but probably more urgent. Like the, the, like trying to figure out those questions was really, were really urgent for me. And that kind of informs my, 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 what I try to do in community and some of my organizing. And thankfully, like I'm in a place where both my, they complement each other. Like the work I do in community complements my academic research and, and vice versa. Um, uh, but I can say that it's a lot easier to analyze things and to like map things out and to write, write about things than actually to live them out and try to take things to market, so to speak, and, and to actually, uh, build and develop communities. That's a far, far more difficult task than, um, than, than writing about it. And that's, that's been something that I've been, uh, that's what I've been seeing in, in, you know, in my world over the last, uh, four or five years. Yeah, and that kind of brings me to another question I've been thinking about this conversation because in your academic work, um, you you use Tet Leaf Collective as a, a case study, and you know we both have a lot of experience with that community, and uh, you know the people involved are dear to us and beloved to us. And I remember a conversation some years ago with Tet Leaf because for people that don't know Tet Leaf in, in the Bay Area. Right across the, the parking lot, there's actually a, a mosque. And I believe it's an Afghani or Pakistani mosque. And Tetlif was really um, wanted to emphasize that we're not a mosque. And so we're going to do our activities here, but we encourage people to go pray there. And, you know, sometimes, you know, between activities when the prayer time came in, we'd go across and pray. And I was reflected on the fact that, you know, it's like my take on that was, and there was this debate actually, should we do Friday prayer because we're not a mosque? That's one thing, a mosque. Right. So if we don't do Friday prayer. And I reflected on that and I said, you know, the thing is, is that that mosque is, is created for a specific, by a specific demographic and it's going to reflect their needs and their wants and their, and that's beautiful. Like there's no critique of that that I have. You know, and, and if a, another community, say the Bosnians or the Somalis or, or another community from the predominantly Muslim world were to come and create a community center down the street, I mean, a masjid rather uh, down the street, I don't think 
too many people would be critical of that. They'd be like, yeah, well, they have their own thing. So that makes sense. But when it is led by American Muslims, converts, and people that are born and raised here, whether they're converts or, or, or the children of immigrants, there was a lot of pushback and a kind of like very self-consciousness of like, we're going against the, the kind of mosque. Are, are we or are we not? Or will it be perceived like that, even if we don't perceive it like that? And I, my kind of like feeling was like, no, like this is, this is a, a different thing. And this speaks to a different demographic, you know what I mean? And it's a different kind of subculture, you could say, within, within Islam. And, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, actually, because, you know, people, you know, my own personal journey within Islam is like, it was rock, him and Rumi. It was hip hop and, and the black Muslim experience. And then Sufism and, 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 you know, that desire for transformation and transcendence and the kind of counterculture West Coast milieu that informed me. And so when I go to Talif, I find that, right, you kind of a Western answer to the Zawiya experience, you know, led by Osama Cannon, who comes from that kind of like, you know, a mixed race, black and white, but comes through that kind of like, you know, his brother converting to Islam because of Chuck being a public enemy. And then, you know, that kind of counterculture thing, but also Osama kind of being in many ways nurtured in the kind of um, Darqawiya community that that predominantly white converts to Islam through Sufism of North African Islam and his, you know, his father-in-law being part of that as well, as far as being one of the Moroccans that took in these, these you know, kind of hippies, essentially, that converted to Islam under kind of, uh, Ian Dallas, Abdul Qadir Sufi, for many of those that know that interesting, very interesting trajectory. So oh, yeah. um, converting to Islam, studying under not only Sheikh Hamza, but having kind of those that came out of that community as his mentors, as far as what community is, and what Islam is, as a lived reality. And so that, you know, kind of, he reflects that kind of like black Islam, as well as the white conversion to Sufi Islam, as well as being traditionally trained and studying in the Muslim world and all those things, kind of embodying them in one individual. And so the community reflects all those cultural currents, which when I found that, that's a breath of fresh air because that's me too. Like I'm all those things as well. And so whereas the other space doesn't speak to those things and, and, and wouldn't even necessarily understand a lot of those and definitely isn't putting them in conversation. So I just personally don't see it as necessarily a problem right? right. that we're you know, spaces are evolving to meet a specific demographic. Totally. Yeah. And I think it, it's so it's, it's, it's hard to do that because we've coupled again to, to, to kind of reiterate, we've coupled mosque and community. So it's almost as though, you know, you, 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 that mosque that's across the way from this community space that we have, um, you know, us, m- duplicating services if you will is somehow putting us in competition with them and that's not a good look and so we, we're just going to avoid that and um it's not it's not done in the spirit of unity and the unit of connection and i think a lot of that has to do with us again conflating mosque and community and then also um thinking that we're all serving the exact same demographic like thinking thinking so broad that we're, we're thinking we serve all the muslims in this locale when in reality, you know, you can never, it's, it's not, it's not really possible. That's what I feel, find fascinating about, about the, my research with the churches was, was that the, the, the churches that often end up being the most successful are the ones that, that plant other churches, you know, that actively go out and say, we can't be everything to everyone. So we're going to train up or we're going to fund or we're going to inspire, or we're going to uh, move to get other church is planted because if a church is not a building, it's a community, you need to have multiple communities because one community won't be the space of belonging for everyone. Like that's just not, it's not how humanity is built out to, to, to exist in this world. So by virtue of that reality, we're going to do our best to have as many modalities of community as possible that we can inspire, that we can fund, or that we can, you know, um, plant ourselves. But Muslims don't. Muslims see that. I think if you were to present that idea to Muslims, they would probably see that to be a threat to unity 
or perce- uh, perceptions of unity. And um, um, I think I think critically assessing that is probably a, a you know uh, an important important first step for you know more people to find access and places of belonging within our faith communities. I think I think that's the first step. Mashallah. Maybe you could speak for those that don't know a little bit about your community uh, and the space that you're involved in there in Edmonton and maybe how that has gone for you, what's your experience, you know, as your years into it now, and also maybe uh, relating to the last question, how it's been received by the broader community or, or the previous generation or the more established mosques. Yeah, that's a great question. So we have uh, the the community that uh, I'm part of uh, was a Tetleaf inspired community. We call it a sister community. It's called Tarjuma, um, and uh, it's been it's been around here in Edmonton since 2014, and in like a kind of like a beta version prior to that, going back to 2012. And again, it was it was inspired by uh, what we saw happening at Tetleaf, and we were in dialogue with uh, leadership at Tetleaf from the very beginning. And eventually, you know, what emerged was this thing that we call Tarjuma, this community that we call Tarjuma. And, you know, these ideas that you and I have been talking about are pretty, like, they can feel kind of abstract. You know, the idea that we, could, we have to somehow decouple mosques, the institution of the mosque, and the notion of community to say mosques are institutions within communities that serve the community but are not the community in and of themselves. Like, that, that idea, I think, is pretty straightforward. but for a lot of actors on the ground that seems like seems kind of ambiguous and they don't really know what they don't really understand what i'm saying when i try to say it so um on the one hand the the you know tarjuma in our city has been pretty well received because edmonton happens to be uh a, a kind of an open city where you know you're just expected to uh it's an open market if you will like you can if you can do it if you can pull together the resources and if you have people who want to participate in your thing, then, you know, all the power to you. And there's not a lot of pushback. That's not the case in other cities. Like, you know, in other cities, even in, in, this same, in the same province in Alberta, the idea that you would have a community space or have a regular community program or try to even establish a sub-community within the larger Muslim community would be push back on hard like it wouldn't be it wouldn't be allowed to prosper without uh several battles at the front so we're lucky to be in a we're fortunate to be in a city like edmonton where it's received either warmly or it's just kind of ignored (laughs) like people just don't care about it which is fine you know because that's our, our attempt isn't to be everything for everyone but it's it's an attempt to be something for ourselves so when we first started you know, the big question was, you know, who are we? What are we? We were grappling with ideas of the so-called third place and the third space. And um, because we were keen on getting down to the uh, the mechanics of making this happen outside of the Bay Area or Chicago, we ended up looking back at, like, the source text for some of these ideas. So we ended up looking back to, uh, I think his name is uh, Oldenburg. Uh, Oldenburg's text on uh, the third, the great good place, and his idea around third place, uh, this place other than the home or work, where a community will come to connect and to unwind and to be themselves. So we we were wrestling with what does it mean to be a third place, and eventually, after some research and after doing a bunch of uh, interviews with people who've actually set up third places uh, around around our city, we realized that a third place was an institution that's meant to serve an existing community. And usually that community in the context of the third place, these coffee shops that were popping up around America, inspired by his book, um, they were designed to serve a local community, like a localized neighborhood community, a community of people who already lived in close vicinity to one another and only needed a coffee shop or a bookstore or whatnot in walking distance um, to augment the community experience. That's what a third place is. And so the idea that we would pop up a third place was kind of, it was putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. What you needed was a community first, and in the case of a third place, a localized community first before you could have a third place, which is why I find, by the way, just kind of a side note, I find it really interesting that 
these Muslim organizations will continually call themselves third places or third spaces. Um, in part because that, um, I think I think maybe what they're trying to get at is the fact that it's not a mosque, so it's a third space, and that's basically become um, the term to describe a mosque-ish space that is not a mosque officially, and that serves some of the intended uh, community needs that a mosque would otherwise uh, aim to provide. Uh, but as far as a third place is concerned, is it you know? By like the definition, the by the book definition, you know, most of them don't don't fall into that, um, fall into those, um, fall into that rubric. So we we encountered that challenge right off the bat that we were trying to establish a uh, an entity, a physical space, without having the community first, if you will. And um, when you do that, when you when you put your resources in establishing a property or a space, your um, attention and your money and your people all go towards getting the space up and running, like literally getting the space up. Um, and they said, you know, one of the things that we often hear from Tatlif was al ma'ani qabla al mabani, you know, meanings technically meaning before buildings or uh, content before form. Um, and we found ourselves when we started thinking about the third place. Uh, setting up a third place, doing the exact opposite of that, putting the building before the people, if you will. And um, so then we we went just trying to investigate how we could, uh, you know, grow a community that served the same types of needs that we saw being fulfilled from a distance by Tetleaf, because we felt at home, even though many of us had never visited Tetleaf, a lot of us felt at home at Tetleaf, a lot of us felt a sense of comfort, we felt like it was relevant. We felt like we were understood at Tetleaf, even if our only interaction with Tetleaf was something online. And uh, what we realized was what we needed not first was not a space, but we needed to gather. We needed to find a way to gather. So we started doing that, and we've been doing like a weekly gathering for the last couple of years. Um, and that's been good. You know, there's been there's been hundreds of people who've come through, and we've done programming on the side as well. And it's a space where you come in, and there's a the you know we design it so that it's for the young family. You know, when you come in, there's there's greeters and there's people who are hopefully going to receive your children and receive them well. And they're going to be loved and cared for for, let's say, an hour of that event. And there'll be content and, and hopefully uh, stuff, you know, a, a message that's that's relevant, that's meaningful for your week. Uh, it's been really good. And there's been, I think, a lot of good that's come from it. And again, we've had hundreds of people who've come through. But communities have front doors and they have back doors. And if you're if you're not careful, you can you can grow a community that has uh, a, an open front door, which is what we want. And uh, we want people to come in and feel like they're welcome, and it has big signs on the front to say, you know, come on in. But then, if you're not careful, you can have just as big or even bigger back door where people come in, they check it out for a little bit, and then they walk out because uh, they haven't connected to anyone. So the expectation of community is not met because we haven't done enough to make sure people connect to one another and so that's the tension that we're facing right now which is what i was you know alluding to earlier which was that you know writing about these ideas is one thing and researching them is one thing but actually making it happen in the real is is a, is a different question and we're trying to figure out how to shut our back door if you will um keep it ajar of course because we always want people to know that they don't have to stay um but uh finding ways for people to feel like no this is a place where i can set up shop or I can I can build a home, or I can uh, I can grow in, and I'll stay stay put in. Um, and yeah, that's kind of like our current challenge is trying to find a way to do that, and and we're we're on the verge of exploring those options uh, in the coming in the coming months, inshallah. No back door, bro. Once you come in, no getting out. It's like a gang, right? <laughs> it's right. Once blood in, blood out. <laughs> exactly which which is which is yeah i mean that's kind of what they say is the fine line between a cult and a really strong religious community which is the door is kept ajar like you can still leave there's a lot of good good compelling reasons to keep you in you know um the 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 unchurched phenomenon i'm uh, sorry the deep church phenomenon people who've left often leave because um uh, it felt more like a cult than it did like a, a community in some instances, or in some instances, it just had a really wide open back door. So they either break through the back door and like say, I'm out of here, I'm never coming back, or they kind of 
just wander out because they were never there were never there's never never anything to keep them to stick in the first place have you seen wild wild country no bro <laughs> you gotta see it on netflix it's like a five-part series about rajneesh osho and his community everybody has to watch it it's so wild oh you wow know, i'm not even gonna say too much but you know he was like an indian guru who kind of like broke with tradition and kind of like became a reformer and got chased out of india because it was kind of like too liberal and kind of like sex oriented and <laughs> and so he started a community in oregon i'm not going to give away too much but it was hugely successful huge land they had like an airstrip they freaking built this wow. whole city they took over like the the mayor of the city they became the police force and like their pink what? uniforms with guns and like the, the medallion of their guru and like they basically it was it's so crazy man it's really amazing like case wow. study of a religious community in america so i won't say anything more but you, wild wild country bro you got to check that out wow man that sounds fascinating yeah i'm gonna <laughs> definitely check that out <laughs> but um you know just in closing i'd love to hear if you have any, you know, with your research, because you've led on a bit here, but I know in talking to you that you have a really wide knowledge and, and understanding. You've really looked deeply at what religious community is and the manifestations of it in modern North America. And you've thought deeply about this, how it relates to the Muslim community vis-a-vis -vis other um, communities. So I'm just curious if you have any reflections about the future and what you see that is encouraging or, or you look, you're look you looking forward to and what you see also that might be concerning as far as what you see developing within the, the Muslim community in North America. I think the, um, I think the one thing that uh, uh, I think about the one thing i think about a lot is this uh, study by F the fuller youth institute um about how a half of christian uh youth evangelical youth in particular like kids who are not done and this is not just people kids who identify as being that but kids who have some sort of participation or some sort of role in youth ministry how half of them uh, or at least half of those who go into college uh, or some sort of post-secondary education will leave their faith within three to four years post high school. Like they, they will no longer identify as being Christian three to four years after leaving their youth ministry. And um, the big Fuller Youth Institute question was, well, what's happening with the other 50%? Like what's happening amongst the group that is sticking, uh, where faith is sticking? Um, and what can we learn from those kids and from those families and from those kids' communities to help um, the other 50% where, you know, the, the numbers show kids leaving the faith. Um, that, that study has fascinated me because I think, I don't know, I know that now with, um, you know, institutions like Yaqeen, Omar Suleiman, uh, Omar Suleiman's institution or uh, think tank or, uh, organization there's there's some there's some research around these these questions but the fascinating thing about the 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 fuller youth institute research was that it was a longitudinal study so these kids were followed over several years so it's going to take some time before you get research like that a longitudinal study that's tracking the faith amongst muslim youth um and uh the emergence of doubt the emergence of like uh people leaving the fold people um, associating with other faith traditions, etc. Like I think we're still a little bit away from, from that. But for me, that that research is still really compelling because um, though there, I don't have the research to say that that same thing is happening with Muslims, I feel at least anecdotally in my own experience, I see it happening around me. And so for me, that's concerning because I happen to be a Muslim who is a father and who has kids and who has nephews and nieces and people, you know, kids in the community who I care for and love and who I want to see grow with a sense of meaning and a sense of purpose, uh, you know, and a sense of direction and um, a connection to the divine. Like that for me, seeing, seeing that, that there's a parallel or some parallels, in, you know, amongst Muslims, it's concerning on the one hand, but on the other hand, I think that 
that same um, realization that that uh, is mirrored to some extent in our own circles is an opportunity to say there's there's ways to respond to it and there's ways to to um, the ways to ameliorate those those challenges. Um, and I think that they're kind of like they're low hanging fruit to some extent. Like some of the some of those institutional challenges are really really hard. Um, to overcome, but some of them are pretty low hanging fruit. The only thing that they require of me uh, and us is our time and our investment in other people. So, you know, one of the one of the uh, things that they saw happen with kids where faith stuck was that often they had multiple mentors beyond just their parents who were pouring into them and who were offering their time and offering their wisdom and offering a shoulder and offering support in whatever shape um, that was appropriate for that other, for that adult mentor, that's not their parent to, to provide it. They were providing it. And so they said that, you know, usually on um, field trips, if you're a teacher, you have a, a one to six rule where you have one adult to six kids um, for proper supervision. They said that what they found was, generally you had that reversed you had for every kid out there you had six adult mentors who were uh in some sort of unofficial way pouring into this kid and that kid knew that they had six people like six adults people who were ahead of them a couple seasons ahead of them in life who they could who could they could reach out to who they could um uh disclose certain things to who would hold them accountable um etc they had six of them. And for me, like growing up as a, as a Muslim kid, I could, you know, I, I, I am, I would dream of having uh, just like one or two of, of that. Like if I could have two, when I was in junior high, if, if two college kids took a keen interest in me, that, that would have made my world. That would have changed my world, I think. And they say like for a junior high girl or a girl who's in high school, um, no one's cooler than another girl who's a season ahead of her, like a single girl who's in college. Like nobody's cooler than you uh, to a, kid, a girl who's in junior high. And you have an opportunity to like to to offer something to that to that person who could be in our community. And uh, that's low hanging fruit. It's literally just a matter of me deciding and making an intention to to offer that to someone in my in my circle or to offer it to one of my friends, kids, etc. And I try to do that. Like we've been trying to do that um, uh, with our, 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 our group of friends and it happens to some extent, but again, like this stuff is easy to, to talk about and to write about, but it's a little bit more difficult to actually do on a consistent basis. So on the one hand, I see like faith and community being running up against a bunch of challenges. You know, we're, we're no longer living with our, our, our community. Like we live in neighborhoods where we're where we don't know our neighbors neighbors that's a pretty common uh observation uh we live uh, uh increasingly more virtual lives than we do like lives in in, in our bodies um we are encountering lots of uh things that would force us into more silos um in our like school worlds and in our work worlds etc so all that stuff is pretty disconcerting and all that stuff has can sound like it doesn't have a lot to do with our faith but it has everything to do with our faith because, because as you said the companions the, the companions around the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam were companions you know they weren't they, we refer to them as companions we don't refer to them as students or disciples you know they had companionship with one another and with the prophet so living in community is inextricably connected to uh, our faith and our spiritual journeys. So there's a lot, there's a lot that is pushing against that. But at the same time, there's there are things like that one thing, you know, like picking up the phone and saying, "I'm going to make an intention and make make it my um, personal obligation, like an obligation I put on myself to stay connected with a kid who is a couple of seasons behind me." Um, just because it's the right thing to do and it's the way that we have to develop these communities in this modern context, you know, these things wouldn't have to happen so intentionally before they would just happen by virtue of us living in these local communities in a pre-modern setting. We got to do it. We actually have to put it up the effort to do it. Um, it's amazing that it's just a phone call away 
And I believe my personal hope is that like, if I do that for someone else, I believe that, you know, come to Dino Dudan, that'll come around full circle and we'll see it for my kids, God willing, and for other kids. And we'll, you know, this is, you know, building community is in a, it's not a one year, two year, five year thing. This It's like a, it's a lifetime, lifelong investment and project. It's not going to end even with the end of my life. I don't believe, I hope, and it will continue how, you know, if it's a real community, it'll be intergenerational. So, um, you know, those small seeds that we plant by doing these small actions, like making the intention to stay connected and to be an inspiration, be support to someone else's kid, I think are the small steps to building a community that uh, is sustaining and life-giving. MashaAllah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And uh, you kind of remind me, um, you know, we've mentioned Tet Leaf a few times. Um, we've mentioned uh, Osama Cannon, who's the uh, founder of Tet Leaf. And uh, I'm reminded that that's how we connected, actually, because when you were kind of in the early phases of Tajuma, before it was called Tajuma, you brought, you were bringing Osama up to do some programs. And uh, you also brought me with him. Mm -hmm. And we did a few programs that, where I was reciting poetry and he was reflecting. And that's how I really connected with you and, and the community up there. So I can't, uh, you know, think about you guys without thinking about him. And, and as you know very well, um, he is somebody who really has, as the great poet Amir Suleiman said, created an institution of love to really institutionalize love as a, as a, as a, as a, as a living reality. And right. with that leaf and in, you know, he's recently been diagnosed with ALS as you and I, both know and so you know i think we just keep him at heart and for everybody who's listening also to to say a, a fatiha say a prayer for him and for his health and, and longevity and his recovery and mm -hmm. uh, you know yeah because that's really what it is and and it really comes back to that when we talk about the prophet muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it doesn't mm -hmm. really matter that the, the prophet's mosque was had no floors but sand and had no roof but date palms and had no walls to speak of it you know because it was the heart the prophetic heart of concern and love and care that was present in that space and so you know that's what i always said about tali for people that came there and felt this love and this beauty i said like if you've been to osama's house you'll feel that like it, it's just like that too and and then really if you take it a step further it's just his heart and if you're right. in no space like his heart is full of loving and concern and care and he, he you know said on multiple occasions a beautiful thing which is like how big how what can you fit in your heart if you think about can you is it your ethnic group is it your country is it your sect is it your religion is it your race right whatever or is it can you expand that expand it further further out until it embraces the entire cosmos known and unknown universe and all things and all beings because that is the muhammadan heart that is the prophetic heart sallallahu alaihi wasallam and uh, you know he's someone who really embodied that and not only embodied that as a theory but actually created institutions which allow people to experience that and taste that and so you know mashallah mm -hmm. i just wanted to mention that uh, as we close and uh, I mean, we, we hold him at heart and we're praying for him and, and his family as well. So, man, I just wanted to thank you, man, for, for coming on. And uh, we look forward to, to seeing you again. And we hope that you bring us back to Edmonton when it's not the winter. <laughs> Actually, what's, what, what are you doing in December? Yeah. <laughs> That's not a joke. <laughs> I'm broke, bro. I can't, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> you saying stay you're gonna stay in the in the southeast in southeast asia that's the uh, favorable yeah mashallah no for real though we we got to talk because because uh, i'm uh, we, we are thinking about mother this year so we uh i'm curious to know what your schedule is yeah, like man. no i'd love to come yeah that was beautiful yeah, um, so yeah i'll leave some links so people can follow your work and your community but if you want to shout out like a website or, or any way that people can connect with you or your community uh, before we close 
Uh, yeah, you can check out Tarjuma at tarjuma.ca. Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram. Uh, we're kind of semi-active on those platforms. We, uh, again, we, we're, we're, we're more a local community than we are an internet community. Um, so um, if you see a lack of activity, that's in part why, and in part because we're just trying to get our, trying to get our act together and uh, trying to figure things out as we go. Um, so yeah, that's where you can check out the Tarjuma's work. And I'm kind of like semi-active on, on social media. Um, so I'm also on Facebook and, and Twitter. Uh, my, uh, my handle on both places is uh, Farouk33. So if there's folks who are interested in having a com- more of a conversation about community, I'd love to have it. We can, uh, we can do it over there. And I definitely encourage people if they if they find themselves in Edmonton that they should definitely go to the green room, right? That's what the space is called. And, uh, yeah, yeah. The green room. The green room is uh, is when we began doing this work was one of the um, kind of sister initiatives that uh, myself and a few other people were part of steering um, towards uh, an actual space. And the the green room is uh, in, in a, another local initiative by by uh, an organization called IFSA. And uh, it's a youth space that's open uh, throughout the weekdays and the weekends, and it's a it's in, it's also kind of like a Tetleaf inspired space. Um, in this case, an actual space. And uh, yeah, alhamdulillah, we have a really really healthy uh, friendship and relationship and kind of like connection with the green room. So yeah, if you happen to be in the city, uh, uh, we'd welcome you with open arms. All right, my brother. Appreciate it. Thank you. Amen. Thank you for listening to Path and Present Podcast. If you want to support the podcast, you can do so in a few ways. One is word of mouth. People hear about the podcast mostly from people like you who listen and like it and say, I know someone who would connect with this, who would feel this, who would enjoy this subject matter. So continue to share with your family and friends. Secondly, you can subscribe, rate, and comment um, on the iTunes page of Path and Present. Subscribing means that the podcast, will, each episode will come directly to you when we release it. And rating and commenting means that it will grow and uh, come up in the iTunes rankings, which will allow it to be uh, available and uh, seen by more people. And then lastly, you can support financially on Patreon. Patreon is a site which allows people to give a small amount monthly to support um, art or any type of content. And we have a Path and Present page on Patreon. The link is on our SoundCloud page, SoundCloud slash Path and Present. And you'll find the Patreon link there. And... Yeah, you can support there. We're greatly appreciative of it. Uh, I guess lastly, lastly, keep us in your prayers, your positive thoughts, and your moments of remembrance. And thank you for tuning in and being part of the global past and present family. One love. Yara